Welcome to Forensic Friday, where I tell you guys one true crime case that was solved using forensic science all while doing, and that's right, my makeup. Today's video will be featuring the ColourPop Lush Life Collection. I'm so excited. I have just been loving these Goosebumps books, earrings, I just think they're so cool. These are the Attack of the jack o lanterns Goosebump novels, but um, I'm gonna have a different set of earrings next week. These are the last of the books that I have, but they're just so cute I had to put them on. Yeah. All the other products I'm using in this video will be linked in the description below. Please read the disclaimer. I am in no way, shape, or form a professional makeup artist or beauty guru or anything like that. I am not a forensic pathologist. I'm just the average girl at home like you playing in makeup and talking about true crime. So if you love true crime and makeup, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any of my future episodes. And let's get into today's case. So this all takes place in Southern California in 1998, where Dr. Richard Barb, he was a Harvard educated neurologist, lived in Glendale. He had been married before, he had children, he had a huge mansion, he had a Rolls Royce. So he was pretty well off. One Saturday morning in 1998, it was early Saturday morning, Dr. Barb called 911 to report that a patient had died in his office is due to some sort of heart attack or heart failure. Hold on, let me check on that because I might be wrong about that, y'all. It was a heart attack. He told police that he had performed an electrocardiogram, which appeared to be normal on the patient. The paramedics arrived at 7.15 a.m., but by the time they got there, the patient was already dead. I need to get her wet. <laughs> I'll be right back. Dr. Barb identified the man as 42-year-old Gene Hansen, who he said had been a patient of his for years. Police were able to identify Hansen by some credit cards and a birth certificate that was found in his wallet along with his license. The paramedics were really suspicious about this because by the time they had gotten there, the body was cold and rigor mortis had set in. And if you guys don't know about rigor mortis, it's a state that the body goes into once it has been dead for a certain amount of time. The first officer that responded to the scene said that the victim's face was very splotchy and the arteries and veins were kind of protruding from his face. For them, that was a huge indicator that he had been dead for a while. Sorry guys, we're just having a little quick fight. Don't worry about us, we're all good over here, okay? The coroner was able to figure out the time of death by comparing the temperature of the victim's liver to the room temperature. Now, bodies drop a degree and a half every hour after death. Now, the temperature of the room was 72 degrees and the temperature of the body was 87 degrees. So based on this, they were able to make a rough estimate that it was about six to seven hours the body had been there after he had died. And that left them with him being dead around 2 a.m. in the morning, which really didn't make sense if Dr. Barb was saying he had just passed away in his office. The lead investigator on the case actually called Dr. Barb out straight to his face and just said, you're, you're a blatant liar, which she said didn't happen. Police was quick, girl, they was quick. I'm so proud of them. Now the lead investigator on the case, he was actually the son of a physician and he knew that something was just not right. Something was missing here. That's another reason why he called Dr. Barb out. Now, Dr. Barb was a doctor for neurology, so he worked mostly on the brain. And police found it really strange that he would be treating a patient for chest pains. It just, it doesn't add up, sir. It doesn't add up, okay? The brain is, is, is up here. Alicia saw this was really suspicious for obvious reasons. Plus, Dr. Barbs did not appear to have performed CPR. I mean, you can never tell if a person actually performed it, but usually a person's uh, shirt is kind of messy, their arm sleeves are rolled up. Like, there should be some like shuffling or dismantling of clothing and even in the person's face or, cause you know, you're doing chest compressions, you're breathing into the, someone else's mouth, you also would probably be a little bit out of breath. 
and at, they didn't find anything. Like there was just too many inconsistencies in Dr. Barb's story for police to believe him. They just knew that Hansen hadn't died the way Dr. Barb was telling them. But they also considered that there may be some other explanation. They began to think that it was some type of like sexual or romantic encounter that had happened or gone wrong, I should say, really, really wrong, actually. They were also thinking that this could be a possible drug overdose. Like, there's so many different things and possibilities that could have happened. Also, in a search of Dr. Barb's office, they found some very, very bizarre things in the drawers that most health professionals don't keep in their office they found some sex toys i mean to each its own we all a listen everybody got needs when and where you need them i'm not judging i'm kind of like low key am but i'm not as a healthcare professional it's a little bit bizarre to keep those things in your office um the only reason why you would keep them in your office is if you're from my seat and perspective is if you are using them in your office yes while it is your office <laughs> but let's try to keep that stuff at home okay let's try to keep it as professional as possible just a general rule of thumb you know things can get awkward to make things even worse i mean they found these sex toys in a number of different spots in his office they also found the sex toys in the examination room it means where the patients are like why would they be in there they found them in medicine cabinets in the drawers with all of the tools and you know stuff that he would use on the patients like that's the scope i can never say it right that that's the scopes that that's the scope how do you say it? to test the to test the that's the scopes i think that's how you say it that's the scopes shame on me my mother's a nurse shame police found out that just a few weeks earlier another man had had an incident in dr barb's office where he reported to the police that he had gone into dr barb's office and dr barb had come in and attacked him with a stun gun it was after hours, I believe, that he had gone to Dr. Barb's office. But then you have to question why had he gone to Dr. Barb's office after hours anyway? I'm not victim blaming. I'm just or shaming or anything like that. I'm just saying choices, 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 people. Everybody makes mistakes, including the victims. Trust me. It's so scary because you always think that your doctor is there to take care of you and help you. So when a healthcare professional turns like this and they're evil, I feel like it's even more traumatizing than if it was just some regular old, you know, Joe off the street. So they found out that the two had met earlier that night at a gay bar. The police kind of chalked it up to two lovers getting into a fight and you know the other one pulling out a taser though like i don't know i don't know why that's acceptable but it was acceptable to them for whatever reason to think that looking into dr barb's personal life police found that he had been recently going through some difficulties he had lost his medical privileges at several different hospitals he had recently gone through a divorce and was uh, openly gay at this point. He had been going through it, you know, and it, I mean, it's, kind of, it's tough. He was going through a really tough time, not by any means justifying his attacks on people. They discovered that Dr. Bob's was a regular at a club that specialized in sadomasochists. Some um, isms? I think it's sadomasochism, yeah. That's the word I'm looking for. He was going to this club that was into like bondaging and like I said, sadomasochism type stuff. Um, to each his own. I really don't, I don't sex shame whatsoever. I like all different types of things. So this is not about my sex life. Why am I bringing it into this video? <laughs> Nobody cares. Nobody wants to hear it. These types of kinks, I will say, um do attract a certain type of person not all people are like that but it does attract uh specific types of people like anything there's bad and good you always have some sort of corruption it doesn't matter what it is 
According to one of the masters in this club, they call him a master. I think that's what they, they call him. I think they're like, he's a, he's a trainer or he does sadomasochism type things. He says that the types of sexual activities that they engage in are not exactly consensual. Um, so that's a lot different. We're hoping that an autopsy report would reveal what exactly happened in Dr. Barb's office. And police were shocked to find that Jean Hansen had died the exact way that Dr. Barb had told them. Non-specific focal myocarditis. Girl, I don't even know what I said. Police brought in Hansen's business partner to identify the body. He positively identified it as his friend, Gene Hansen. Now his business partner's name was Hawkins and Hansen and Hawkins, this is tricky, okay, to say. Hansen and Hawkins owned a some sort of clothing business. I believe the clothing company was selling sweats i believe it was like sweatpants and sweatshirts and things like that they had done commercials for their brand which was called just sweats i think it's so cute just sweats and hawkins was actually a regular in the commercials that they would film you could see him alongside the commercials like dancing in his sweats and stuff like that don't get confused Hansen, Gene Hansen is the victim and Hawkins is Gene Hansen's business partner who identified the body. Just wanted to say that in case some of you got confused because I'm starting to get confused. Like, but then again, I'm always confused, so. Now it appeared that Hansen and Hawkins had this really successful business. You know, they were both driving really nice cars. They had multiple business locations as well. It appeared that these two men were living like the high life. Gene Hansen's body was cremated and his ashes were scattered in the ocean. John Hawkins, Gene's business partner and friend, the one who identified him, was the sole beneficiary of his estate. Now, it just so happened that this state included a $1 million life insurance policy. After the funeral, John Hawkins returned to Ohio and then vanished. Police found his convertible Mercedes at the airport with the top left down and this is Columbus, Ohio. And they say that that day there was rainy weather and he just left his top down. So clearly he was not coming back or didn't care. Sometime later, the caseworker for Gene Hansen's life insurance policy called trying to figure out how to get a copy of Gene Hansen's driver's license. She needed the driver's license to put in her case file. At this time, a California driver's license not only included a photograph, but it also had, you know, the person's thumbprint on it. The thumbprint on Gene Hansen's driver's license did not match the thumbprint that was taken in the morgue. The insurance company reported this to the police. And after looking through their files, they found that a 32 year old accountant had been reported missing. The accountant's name was Ellis Green. Now, when the photograph of Dr. Barb's patient was shown to Ellis Green's family, they positively identified him as Ellis Green. So, what the um uh, is going on here because his business partner is saying he's gene hansen okay dr barb is saying he's gene hansen all of his information and birth certificate is saying that he's gene hansen and ellis green's parents are saying that it's actually their son ellis green if that's really ellis green then where is gene hansen and who is gene hansen and why is Ellis Green pretending to be Gene Hansen? Although, you know what? I really did think it was suspicious that someone would carry their birth certificate in their wallet. Like, who does that? Nobody does that. It's like the equivalent of carrying your social security card in your wallet, which don't do that. <laughs> Guys, don't do that. Now, when police confronted Dr. Barb, he told them that he was shocked because, I mean, oh my God, right? Because this person had been coming into his office for years and was always known as Gene Hansen. But then the detectives took a closer look at Gene Hansen's medical files and they found a startling discovery. 
In three different doctor visits, Dr. Barr performed EKG tests on Hansen. But when forensic scientists compared those three EKG tests, the inconsistency amongst other things like the tear in the papers showed them that this was actually from the same EKG test, that they weren't looking at three different EKG tests. They was actually looking at the same one that was performed on the exact same day. What in the fuck, Dr. Barb, are you doing out there, dude? Seriously, making the docs look bad, honestly. Medical detectives decided to send out Ellis Green's blood and tissue samples to a more sophisticated testing center. This center was able to do some very intricate testing, including gas chromatography, which could identify hundreds of toxic chemicals found in human tissue. Unfortunately, none was found in Jean Hansen. The next thing they did was bring in a second forensic pathologist to re-review the original findings. Now this new forensic pathologist did notice some unusual discoloration under Ellis Green's fingertips and in his facial tissues. This forensic pathologist found that the evidence actually showed suffocation. Now these particular findings that they found underneath the fingernails and in the face, the discoloration, usually disappears shortly after death, which is why sometimes suffocation can go unnoticed. Now even though Dr. Barb was proclaiming his innocence, saying that he didn't do anything, he was still arrested on suspicion of murder. Now it's time to go into the palette, but anyway back to the story. Police were pretty sure that Dr. Bob was their guy, but there was just one other question. Did he act alone? Was John Hawkins involved? And where in the hell was the real Gene Hansen? So as investigators did some further digging, they found out that Dr. Barb was actually going bankrupt. He was pretty much broke. He had lost a lot of money. He had gone through a divorce, so that can obviously leave a person pretty dang broke. So just consider that, consider that. Okay. He was losing his house and his car. He had tried a few other business ventures, but they all failed. And it didn't look like he had that much good luck with love either. I feel like a lot of people that's obsessed about money are not that lucky with love. Like they're just not. But you know, you need love to balance that out. Cause you can be successful and not be happy. I mean, I guess it depends on what, what success equals to you. To me, it equals happiness. So I need both. <laughs> okay, my love, I need both. He had a lot of bills piling up. I mean, he was so behind that police say when they went into his apartment, they found an entire bathtub filled with bills, just like bills directed towards the doctor. So the doctor, the good old doctor, had just taken his bills and put them in his bathtub. He wasn't paying them. He wasn't even opening them. I mean, I feel like that's sometimes too, not gonna lie. Now, after buying a $1 million life insurance policy, Gene Hansen told his friends and colleagues that he was dying of AIDS. No shame, which obviously wasn't true. He also told them that he was planning to move to California. Before he left, he made John Hawkins the sole beneficiary of his estate, eliminating his wife and family from the will. Clearly, these guys were very strategic in this entire scheme. Like this, this was some serious thought processing going on here. I don't know what happened with the camera. It probably left a few things out and I'm sorry if it did. With further investigation into the clothing business that Gene Hansen and John Hawkins owned together, they found some pretty significant financial losses. Investigators believe insurance scam could be the possible motive for Ellis Green's murder, and that Dr. Boggs, Gene Hansen, and John Hawkins were all involved. Police had no idea how the three men originally met, but they knew that both Hawkins and Hansen had been patients of Dr. Boggs for years. Phone records showed that they were in constant communication, and that the three men's engagement increased around the time of the murder. They also found that the murder may have been planned for over a year. Police believe the man met Ellis at a gay bar one night and he fit all of the requirements that they were looking for. He looked very much like Gene Hansen. He was also gay and HIV positive. So 
That was all the requirements they need Plus the fact that he was really, really heavily intoxicated just made it super easy for them to take advantage of him. Uh, what do you guys think? Let me know in the comments down below. What do you think? Like what should happen next? I could just bring all of this down, but I just feel like I will look like a bandit. So they believe that the two men enticed Ellis, maybe told him like, hey, let's go hang out at our apartment or whatever, or let's uh, have a threesome probably, something, something like that, you know? And you know, Ellis Green was a pretty nice guy. He was very outgoing. He probably was down for some, you know, some new experiences, we'll call it that. <laughs> he probably felt like he could trust these guys and he unfortunately left with them. Oh, I'm kind of liking this. Go bandit, go bandit, go. Go bandit, go bandit, go. Yeah, I'm looking like a cute ass bandit though. You know what I'm saying? Like this isn't an ugly bandit. Like if I had to be a bandit, I would rather be a cute ass bandit like this. This is really cute. I'm really liking it. Police found that at the same time that paramedics had arrived to Dr. Barb's office to save Ellis Green, that a man fitting Gene Hans's description checked into a nearby hotel right across the street from Dr. Bob's office. He did check into this hotel under an alias name, but later the real Gene Hansen received a telephone call from John Hawkins in Ohio. And when Ellis Green was pronounced dead, John Hawkins flew to LA from Ohio. That's when he identified the body as his friend, Gene Hansen. He had the body cremated and collected the $1 million life insurance money. After this, Hawkins and the real Gene Hansen vanished, leaving behind their bankrupt business. They did not care. They were like, okay, we're just gonna get out of here and pretty much go and start over. The search for John Hawkins and Jean Hansen took over three years and police literally had to travel halfway around the world to find these two men and track them down. It was really difficult, but they did have Dr. Barb, however, because he was still left behind in California and to face these murder charges alone. But finally, investigators got a break in the case when they got a tip that led them all the way to Florida. A fingerprint on a drinking glass in an apartment that identified Gene Hansen as the residence. In the home, they found evidence that Gene Hansen had in fact fled the country. But just a few months later, Gene Hansen was arrested at the Dallas Fort Airport. He was actually on his way back from Mexico. Seems like everyone's like hiding in Mexico. I think the last story I did, someone flew to Mexico and was hiding there. So he got arrested because the airport security had noticed that he was behaving rather odd. And they could still see like the scars and like stitches from the plastic surgery and hair transplant that he had gotten. This man went all out. I'm talking about face off all out. You know what I mean? Like this is the real face off right here. Now get this, you guys, he denied that he was Gene Hansen and police also found Ellis Green's driver's license on him. They also found a book on him called How to Create a New Identity, as well as several different identification cards. I mean, God knows how many people this man has been. So police did do a fingerprint test on him again. And what do you know? His fingerprints match that of the real Gene Hansen. So finally, police had found the real Gene Hansen. He was arrested immediately and taken into custody. Now, police had a much more difficult time finding John Hawkins because they would describe him as some sort of chameleon. He could just blend in to different lifestyles, they said, and different um, identities and personalities. So it was very, very difficult for them to find him. In addition to all the different identities that he could portray, he had the money to back those identities up. You always hear about these type of things in the movies and you never think that they're real until you hear stories like this and you're like, wow, this is not made up. Like, 
So for the next three years, John Hawkins used the insurance money to travel all over the world as he created these different fake identities um, until he tripped up, he got tripped up. A woman watching America's Most Wanted called in with a tip. She had seen an America's Most Wanted episode and recognized him. Now this woman, she lived all the way in Amsterdam and she was one of John Hawkins's former girlfriends or lovers, something like that. Using the information that she provided, investigators were able to locate John Hawkins off the coast of Sardinia. He was in a small red boat called the Carpe Diem. Now, when police confronted him, he obviously denied that he was, he was like, no, I am not John Hawkins. They said he was really nasty, very arrogant, and was like, you guys got this all wrong. I'm an English citizen. I am Br something, something Bryant or another. I don't even know. I believe he said he was a Bradley Bryant and that they had gotten it all wrong, that he was an English citizen. He even provided an identification that was a legit identification. He presented police with a legitimate British passport, so they were like, what? They knew he wasn't, but at the same time, he is presenting the correct identification. Using fingerprints, John Hawkins was positively identified. Prosecutors argued that financial problems brought all three men together to make this life insurance scheme so that they can get the $1 million, and they conspired the murder of Ellis Green together. Now, Dr. Barb's role was to identify and murder a lookalike of Gene Hansen. His first target was Bruce Smith. When he failed at that, he turned his sights onto Ellis Green. Thank God they were able to capture these three men because they later found out that they were actually planning a another murder to collect life insurance. This time they were looking for a John Hawkins lookalike. Thanks to forensic science and some good police work, Dr. Boggs and Gene Hansen was convicted of murder and conspiracy to commit murder and insurance fraud. Both were sentenced to life in prison without parole. John Hawkins was convicted of conspiracy to commit murder and insurance fraud. He was sentenced to 25 years to life. What did you guys think about this case and my makeup look? Please let me know in the comments down below. If you like videos like these, check out my last episode. I'll leave a link on the screen or right here or right here. And as always, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you guys next Friday, Saturday, or Sunday with another Forensic Friday episode. Bye.